Chairman and Honourable Members, thank you for this opportunity. I'm a researcher and lecturer at the University of KwaZulu Natal, specialising in meteorology, air pollution, and environmental health. I'm here today representing a group of atmospheric scientists based in Durban. We are concerned about the effects of the proposed amendments on academic research. I think a difficulty in presenting later in the program is that many of the pertinent points have been discussed, but I'd appreciate 10 minutes of your time to offer a brief perspective from within the academy. Our first concern regarding air pollution warnings has been largely resolved by discussions yesterday. As part of my community outreach activities, I work closely with CBOs in Durban modeling and monitoring air quality, and I'm pleased that the restrictions posed by 38-1A will be revised. However, I still want to pick up on the issue of severe weather warnings in case this provision remains in the bill. If such warnings are to be limited, it is suggested that the terms severe weather, severe weather and warning are very clearly defined. I could comment on the distinction between an extreme weather and severe weather event at the end of my presentation if that would be useful. Mr. Morgan brought this issue up yesterday. I also appreciated the comment from Mr. Morgan yesterday that we need to distinguish between public warnings and warnings within smaller networks or groups. I'm often presenting model predictions at academic conferences, for example. Various research groups and private companies have developed to fulfill forecasting requirements that are not sufficiently addressed by SOARS at present, such as the capacity to issue real-time warnings of tornadoes or dangerously high levels of UV radiation. Schedules 1 and 2 of the Act and the amendments read as though SOARS is the only institution that conducts the activities listed, when in reality the Atmospheric Science Network is much broader and more collaborative than suggested. Although we firmly believe that the South African public should have access to weather warnings by any forecasting institution acting in good faith, Perhaps the compromise would be to maintain the distinction between warnings and official warnings on severe weather events. As such, any institution could make a severe weather warning as long as this is made in an unofficial capacity. This would also deal with the issue of impersonators. It wouldn't matter if your warning was correct or misleading or false or a hoax. You would be prosecuted for impersonating sores. Our next concern is data access, an issue touched on yesterday by the Hamlet representative. Weather data is a basic input for various climate and air quality models. The bill formalizes the shift away from a public service, service to a more commercial model for SOARS. We are concerned that the commercialization of weather data could stifle research and innovation. It certainly would limit opportunities for academic research where funding is often a concern particularly with student research. Early last year, I advised a student to change research topic after being quoted more than 5,000 rand for the rainfall data set required to assess rainfall cyclicity in northern KZN, an important analysis in the context of climate changes in the region. No country, and certainly not South Africa, can afford to inhibit research and innovation in the field of climate science. In light of these issues, perhaps provision could be made under Schedule 1 to provide the commercial data packages that are described in Schedule 2 to academic researchers at no extra cost. On a more technical note, focusing on air quality data, any limitations on access to air quality data would conflict with SOAR's requirements under the National Framework for Air Quality Management. While perhaps some processed data packages could be sold to commercial enterprises, SOARS needs to ensure that unprocessed air quality data remains freely available and is easily accessible to the public and researchers as required under the national framework. The amendment bill in its current form fails to acknowledge this obligation. Perhaps something further could be included under Schedule 1. I now shift my concerns onto Section 38.1c. This subsection was brought up yesterday and is largely resolved, but I want to frame the issue slightly differently so when the bill is revised, our perspectives can be incorporated. 
Our concern with this issue is that it limits academic critique of SOAR's data collection methodologies, processing, or analysis. Scientific knowledge develops through cycles of theorizing, critique, reassessment, and re-theorizing. While critique of SOARs may be detrimental to its scientific image per se, such critique is a natural and necessary mechanism for encouraging innovations within the scientific model. It concerns us that academics, and others of course, could be criminally prosecuted for any criticisms that have financial repercussions for SOARs. This now overlaps with the debate yesterday, so I'll stop you there. Just as a final comment, I feel that you may have received more submissions from academics had this coming period not taken place over the festive season. The university's only reopened in the last week. Thank you. Keep it on. But your point stay. You know, I, look, on the issue of the commercialization, you know, we, we every year we engage with SOARS. And as I've said, if you have information available where that kind of restriction is being created mm -hmm. through research, um, obviously research which has of an academic nature, mm -hmm. you know, not research which is going to have a commercial Commercial's value yeah. in the end. But I'm sure there's a distinction that can be made and, you know, a whole lot of provisions and subject to and so on can be made that it's genuine academic. So if you have any of those issues where such commercialization is creating problems, let us have the information so we can right. engage it's source when they come to us later in the year, okay? It's definitely a new issue. Um, I worked with source doing research for six years and as of 2011, um, I was told that there were restrictions on the amount of data we had access to. Now what happens with agencies, you know, once you, once it has a public function and it's getting public money, and then you attach a commercialization issue to mm -hmm. it, and the way that the agency then wants to get money and not be so reliant on Parliament because they know they're going to get a certain slice of the cake, mm -hmm. is clearly they start commercializing more and more of their services. Correct. It's a natural, yeah. I mean, if I'm sitting there as a head of a board, and I'm thinking, uh, how do I get money and so on? That happens. But the issue for us is, and, and, and in some instances it has to be like that. I mean, you know, where businesses are going to use that advantage, they should pay for it. But in those instances where we, for example, as parliamentarians, think that um, uh, that, that information should be more, more available, we're happy to engage source on those issues. Mm -hmm. And if it is that their functions then have to be limited, because clearly they can only do that if their functions allow them to commercialize in that area. Otherwise, they're working outside their, their remit. But if it does that, then we have to find ways of limiting that. Mm -hmm. Where we, as politicians, as the legislators, as policymakers, feel that that information shouldn't be commercialized and it should rather be um, uh, funded from tax money. So there's a delicate balance to be traded. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't want to get too technically involved. But as I said, like this is a prime example. Yeah. I, it's not acceptable to me that a genuine research is being done, yes. which can help the rest of the country formulate policies, find out what weather patterns are, and we trying to block a student by 5,000 rand. Um, to, you know, it's just unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. So that kind of thing mm -hmm. uh, is, is the kind of thing we would want to look at. Okay? So, so on that score. And on the other two, uh, definitely, the A and B of 30A, um, we only want to limit it to intentions. I haven't engaged with Mr. Morgan on the issue, and we'll do it when we debate these issues on whether you want to make it private or, or public. Um, I think there's a debate to be had. Because if you restrict it to false and to misleading and to hoaxes, then I don't think you need to just make a distinction because you've limited it only to. Because even something that's given on a private network, mm -hmm. if someone else takes that, not the user, and then uses it uh, more publicly, mm -hmm. then you have a problem. If you originally say, this is not going to be all under the crime, you're creating big problems. And then people, there's immediately a loophole. They can take that information then and use it elsewhere. But we'll have that debate. I think it's a separate debate. Uh, it depends on how we word the clause. Um, and if we keep to the issues, then we'll, we'll have that debate further. So we will definitely look at that issue further. But any questions, uh, Mr. Morgan?